Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are. Let's give hello. Hi. Let's give other folks a few minutes to join, and then we can get started. I guess we can get started. Uh, we have quite a few participants on call today. Um, so to start with, um, if we have any new members who would like to introduce themselves, um, please speak up your name and what you would like to get out of these meetings. Anyone? Hey, uh, my name is Ryan Waite. Uh, this is the first time I'm joining this meeting. I was invited to join because one of the projects we're talking about today is called Copacetic. Uh, I run the, the Azure Open Source Incubations team, and Copacetic was an incubation that we put together in our group, and it's graduated and it's now being run in production at, at Microsoft, and I'm just super happy to see it's moving along this path. So um, just happy to be observing in, in today's session. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mike. I am a developer advocate on the Falco project over at Sysdig, and so I just joined this today to get a broader purview into what's going on in security at large within CNCF and whatnot. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I can go next. next. Uh, my name is Sertaj. Um, I work as a dev lead in Microsoft. Uh, I'll be doing the presentation with Copa today. Welcome, was it? Was it Kat? Sorry, I'm Xander. <laughs> I, uh, I'm also with Microsoft here to talk about Copa. Um, I brought a whole coalition with me, as you can see. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of us. Welcome, Xander. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, very nice to have we all in the meeting today. Um, anyone else? If not, we'll start with our work group updates. Um, do we have anyone from supply chain security working group? I know we have a larger presentation today from them as well. Um, but any updates, quick updates? It's not. Um, anyone from a Zero Trust working group? I can provide a little update on that. Um, the Zero Trust um, project leads have sent out an email to the whole tag. Um, they they are publishing a Zero Trust Cloud Native um, security white paper. Um, they have sent that out for review. So if you could please review it and put your comments, um, that'll be much appreciated. Do we have John Zola? John, uh, do you want to provide an update on the next steps for the security controls working group? Uh, yeah, nothing really has changed there. We are still working on um, automating the translation from the CSV that we made to um, OSCAL, and then working to package, uh, package that up with the white paper releases. Um, so that's that's something that's been languishing a little bit, admittedly, uh, for sure. But that's kind of final loose end. Well, yeah, let's talk offline to see how we can make progress there, or what 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 help do you need from us so we can provide that to the working group. Thank you, John. Um, Justin, do you want to provide an update on security pals and what is cooking there? Sure. Um, so we completed the Pixie assessment, uh, it's it's finalized. 
um, and merged everything in. They may do a presentation at some point about this, but it's been completed. And in a meeting right after this, then the flat car assessment uh, should also be completed quite soon. We'll at least present our findings, which is the last sort of step of the process. Um, and uh, we're back to the point where we have capacity to do um, assessments and things. So if there's a group that's done a self-assessment that wants to have a joint assessment done, um, I think that uh, now is a great time to mention that. Um, I've just been going through the queue and looking at issues and trying to see if anybody seems ready. Also, the security book um, has been sent off to folks in the LF. It seems to be ready to go. Um, there is also a new effort that's uh, being undertaken now by Eddie Knight and a few other people um, to try to create like a training course uh, on to ease the process of creating a self-assessment. Uh, and finally, I do have uh, someone who's going to be working with me over the next few weeks to try to do the Security Pals process that we're going to do in mass in the fall. And uh, so I pointed them at a sandbox project that I picked at random off of the uh, landscape thing. And they're going to start interacting with that project. And I will be reporting back. And they may even come to this group and give a presentation in a few weeks and uh, talk about that process. I shared that just soon. Thank you so much. Um, any other working groups? that want to provide any updates to the wider tag here? If not, then we can jump into our first agenda item, which is a, a presentation by Supply Chain Security Working Group. Mike and John, you're up. Yep. Uh, so John uh, had to, to hop off. Uh, he has a conflict, but uh, I can talk to um, what we've been working on. So, um, and, and a little bit of a, a broader thing. It's mostly, don't have any slides, mostly just gonna be um, talking to it and then also showing off a little bit of where to find uh, what we're doing. So uh, to start off, um, uh, let me start off by saying, you know, um, the, Everybody, you know, at least I assume most of you have been hearing about the software supply chain security attacks and those sorts of things um, that have been going on uh, uh, recently. And, you know, hey, it's making a big impact, yada, yada, you know, normal stuff. Uh, so what the tag security did uh, starting a few years ago, um, they started a uh, working group called the software supply chain security um, working group that is part of tag security. And that's where we started uh, doing some work. And so the first thing is we have a uh, software supply chain security white paper, and I'll show that off in a second. Um, and actually before that, uh, and, and I'll, at the end, I'll also explain um, uh, how to get involved yourself. Uh, one second here. Uh, sorry, I'm having some issues with my PC right now, so, or my MacBook, I should say. All right. And most of, all of this stuff is, is located in our, um, in our, in the tag security GitHub repo, but just to uh, show off, where is this? There we go. Why is it not letting me share? There. Um, so the first body of work that came out of the working group, at least as far as I'm aware, um, I joined right after uh, I believe the group had started, uh, was um, the Software Supply Chain Best Practices uh, White Paper Guide, which is, um, let me just, And it is a, uh, it's a guide that we wrote up um, talking through a lot of the software supply chain security challenges, um, specifically 
how they relate to uh, cloud native. And so uh, the basic idea, right, is a software supply chain attack is really an attack against your software delivery lifecycle. And when we're talking about cloud native, we are talking about you know stuff like containers, stuff like zero trust, and and that sort of thing. So how can we sort of apply um, cloud native best practices to securing our supply chain? And so it goes into all the different uh, uh, areas of the supply chain. So we're talking about your source and dependencies. So how am I how am I sure that I'm pulling in um, secure source? How am I sure I'm pulling in secure dependencies? How am I secure? You know, and then it kind of moves on to things like building and and actually developing the code internally. So things like how am I sure that I'm building my code correctly? How am I avoiding stuff like a solar winds attack? That kind of thing, and then. Um, the next thing is like kind of like the network aspect of it, of how am I sure that I'm distributing my code in a secure way? Um, you know, two things like, or how am I publishing my code in a secure way? And then how am I actually deploying it in, in a secure way? Um, and, you know, with a focus in this white paper, you know, was mostly focused on things like, you know, containers over, let's say a legacy mainframe, that kind of thing. And so there's a lot of different um, activities that are explored here. Uh, these, you know, in certain cases, like for example, with the build, it's keep your build granular and and try and make sure that you can reason about individual steps quite succinctly. So if a step goes wrong, you know, uh, you can start to point some of those things out. And there's a lot of suggestions in here that are involve a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, cloud native focused technologies like Tecton, like Intoto, like Tough, and and those sorts of things. And so uh, I recommend folks checking it out. It's a pretty, um, you know, uh, pretty rigorous there. You know, it goes into stuff like S bombs, goes into stuff like, uh, you know, securing your build, uh, goes into stuff like how you could potentially securely uh, deploy using zero trust through things like Spiffy Spire and 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 that sort of thing. It's not an implementation guide, but it it does provide some of those high level um, things. Before moving on from that to the secure software factory, does anybody have any questions about uh, that document or about anything that we've worked on there? Mike, just, just a suggestion, if you can put the link in the chat, that'd be great. Oh yes, 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 sorry. I will, yeah, I will do that. Let me just bring up the chat. And I apologize again for not having a uh, more formal presentation, but uh, no there's been some there's been some drama in OpenSSF that I've been dealing with as a tech member. So, um, no cool. So now uh, after that, there is um, the uh, secure software factory, and so that's also underneath, um, and most of this stuff is involved here. And um, I'll also talk about the, the compromises afterwards, but uh, most of the stuff that's the output of the supply chain security stuff that is focused on the tag security is, is, is in here. And so the uh, software, uh, whoops, the secure software factory white paper, um, and I'll just download this as well. And right. So the software, uh, the secure software factory was the next sort of step um, for the group. And the group then worked on, um, the secure software factory is something I co-led along with a few other folks. Um, the secure software factory is a focus on the build piece of uh, the software supply chain. So as we kind of looked at in the sort of best practices guide, once again, it's the software, you know, software supply chain security is mostly about from, um, you know, how do I make sure that I am developing and ingesting uh, software in a secure way, right? So how am I sure that, sorry, I should say producing and consuming software in a secure way. And the uh, best practices focused on all sorts of different aspects like it focused on the build, but it also focused on things like um, secure ingestion and that sort of thing. Now the focus with the secure software factory was purely on stuff like the CICD pipeline. How are you sure that that piece um, is secure? And the reason why uh, we had focused so much on um, the build piece is because 
you know, if you look at the solar winds attack, that was kind of a critical piece there. If you're looking at some of the other things that we've seen with folks in like Circle CI and some of these other things, like, hey, how am I sure that like my actual build is secure? Because um, the build is one of the most critical pieces because it's very hard to reason about. And the reason why I say that, right, is, is if I look at a set of dependencies, I know I'm pulling down a set of files. I can do something about that. I know I should only be pulling down a set of files. But if I look at a build, a build can often do stuff like compilation and other things like that, which you are taking a bunch of potentially like text files along with other binaries, doing some operation against them. And now you have a new binary. And that sort of thing can be very hard to reason about. Um, so that's where, you know, that was sort of the impetus for creating the uh, secure software factory. And um, I recommend folks also checking this out. Uh, the basic ideas here, once again, are how do we secure the build in a cloud native way? So that means applying zero trust, applying sort of DevSecOps, applying, um, you know, uh, looking at it in a container focused world in, in, in that sort of way. And so at a very, very high level, it is about how can we secure three main aspects of the build. The first is how, do I, how am I sure that I'm securing the actual pipeline definition? So like when I go and say I should be building it in this way, I should pull down the code, I should generate an SBOM from the source, I should then run a build, I should then run, let's say, SCA scan against the build, and finally I should publish it. How am I sure that I'm actually, that the definitions I am doing are, are within a security policy? So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect is, great, now that I've defined um, the rules and I should be following those rules for the, the policy, how am I sure that that's actually what the, the CI system or the build system is being told to do, right? One of the concerns and that we've seen this, right, with things like Tecton, but we've seen this with other things is, hey, an admin to the cluster can go in and say, yep, you're running this build, but now I want you to run a different build. And it's very hard to detect that that's actually what happened. So that's the second piece. And then finally, the third piece is, okay, now if we take an actual microscope to what's happening in the build itself, in this case, when in the cloud native perspective, usually something like a container, how am I sure that that container isn't compromised in some way, right? And uh, you know somebody is execing into the container, or that somebody is, um, or that the container, like the base image that the container build is running, was somehow has malicious software in it, right? So we really explore that sort of um, idea throughout uh, this document, and uh, yep, and so yeah, that's that's kind of where we focus, and once again. The solutions are around the space of like workload identities like Spiffy Spire, which is you know a CNCF project, um, looking at things like uh, eBPF to explore um, for runtime visibility into what the actual container is running and to make sure like, hey, is this container starting to poke around in random places in memory? Is it, is it you know, are you execing things? You know, is it seemingly downloading things and then execing them? when it should only be running compilation, that kind of thing. Um, and then separately looking at policy uh, frameworks, you know, policy engines like OPA, as well as Kiverno to go and essentially enforce that both um, the policies we are giving to a CI CD system, uh, sorry, the, the pipelines we are giving to a CI CD system are within policy. And then in addition to that, also ensuring that only the, um, that only like uh, uh, approved images are allowed to be part of the build pipeline. So that means both from a build workload. So, hey, is this is this image that I'm about to use as as the base image for my build? Is that safe? Is it good? Is it um, you know is it within policy? As well as you know the pipeline itself. Am I running an approved? Um, sorry, the pipeline uh, uh, tools. So like your Tecton. Am I actually running? Tecton that came from the Tecton maintainers, or did I download a malicious image, right? That's kind of uh, uh, the big pieces there. And then finally, you then have a signed image at the end. 
um, it, that, you know, often with the metadata associated with it. So stuff like a salsa attestation, stuff like an SBOM and those sorts of things. And then you could, which you can then use downstream in a similar way to enforce that, yes, I'm only allowing the use of, um, of software that is, has been built through something like a secure software factory. So that was the next big piece of uh, work coming from the CNC, uh, from uh, the, the uh, secure, uh, sorry, the software supply chain security working group. Um, before moving on to the next, whoops, that's not the right one. That's my local thing. Uh, this is the right link to that. Um, before moving on to the next one, uh, do folks have any questions? So Mike, if you can talk a little bit about admission controller and what goes into that, I think that that would, that will be helpful because I sure. know that, that is um, explained in the document as well. So. Sure. So one of the big pieces for um, admission control and why it's super important for software supply chain security, right, is you want to, you know, it, and it kind of ties into zero trust and really like a lot of supply chain security is zero trust, but not for your users and not for your servers, but for the artifacts, right? Like, you know, it, it's zero trust to essentially say, is this thing I'm about to run, this piece of software, a container image, that kind of thing, is it allowed to run? What does it have permissions to, right? And, and it's about essentially always verifying that that's the case. So, you know, there, you know, just as an example, the recommendations we all obviously provide are things like, you should be pinning to hashes of images, do not use tags, right? Because tags can be replaced. And, you know, all it takes is a tag, uh, you know, let's say if you're on latest, all it takes is, um, and if you just say, hey, I pull whatever down that's the latest, all it takes is for somebody to compromise the registry, they push out a new image. And then the next time you run a thing, you'll pull down the latest version of that image is now you're pulled down a compromised version of that image, as opposed to, hey, we ran a bunch of checks against this particular digest of an image, and we determined that that image is good, and we believe it to be safe, and then we use that image, and then we have that, um, and we, we have a policy against that. So the way that uh, policy engines like Keyverno and OPA work within a Kubernetes framework, but this is, um, uh, is it essentially just sort of looks at um, the various, uh, you know, um, uh, the various resource uh, YAMLs and those sorts of things. It, it looks at the resources that get pulled in and then is able to sort of tease out the different elements and is able to go and say, yes, uh, you have defined that this should be running this image. And, you know, is this image within the policy I understand? And there's lots of different ways to define the policy. You can define the policy based on you know, a query to another database to say, hey, I looked up in my, my uh, list of approved images database. Is it in my list of approved images? It could be in just a, uh, you know, a config map. There's all sorts of different ways to, to manage that. But the general idea is you can kind of have um, a, you know, you can uh, have a set of queries that could be run to essentially say, yes, this is good or no, this is bad and it shouldn't be allowed. And it could be, in you know, most cases right now, it's usually something like an image, but it could also be used against things like you know, Tecton resource definitions. So you can say, hey, I have a Tecton pipeline, which is once again, you know, Kubernetes YAML, right? Um, and you can say, well, this Kubernetes YAML, I expect all of my pipelines to include an SBOM step that looks like this. And if it doesn't include an SBOM step, I'm sorry that pipeline's not allowed to run, it's not valid. Sounds good. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Appreciate it. No problem. Um, any other questions before I, I move on? Uh, hey, this is Ryan. I had, I had a question. Um, sure. And, and I'm not the expert in the space like you are, but uh, is is rollback ever part of the way that you would think about your secure software factory in the sense that something did get all the way through the pipeline and it still turns out that it's wrong. And so you need some sort of way to roll back to kind of a last known good uh, uh, image. Yeah, so that's actually a key bit of this is, is we believe that you need to have something like this to do secure rollback, sorry, to do rollback in a good way, because by keeping track of all the different components, 
it makes it much easier to identify when something has gone wrong, as opposed to it's just another build. And when you go back and you go, hey, wait a second, um, ha what happened? What, what actually went wrong? The idea here is the, all the metadata and logs that should be coming out of this are all directly correlated to that signed image now. And you should be able to kind of see that, hey, this um, eBPF report on what actually happened in the build and this uh, set of build logs and this salsa attestation, this SBOM are all cryptographically tied to um, this image as opposed to just what we see a lot right now is, yeah, I have an SBOM and I'm claiming it's about this thing, but I have not a lot of ways to actually check whether or not that's actually the case. Whereas in this, assuming you trust the secure software factory, you can do that, which then makes it much easier for when you go and you say, hey, wait, we discovered something in run at, at, at runtime. Um, we discovered a problem. And we think that like this is actually compromised and it actually made its way past all these other checks. Right. You can then go back to then say, great, we've rolled it back. Now let's actually look through the salsa attestation, the SBOM, the build logs, the eBPF report, and say, is this like what happened? Is there evidence of some malicious behavior or do we need to add something new or hey, did our actual secure software factory get compromised? Like that helps you sort of um, narrow that down. And that's a big part of the paper is by doing it this way and kind of trying to make sure that each of the individual, and we kind of talk about this a little bit in, in this step, right? Where if you sort of make each of these tasks very granular, then it helps you identify which, is, which of the tasks is the one that it went wrong in, right? Because a lot, of, a lot of things we see today is people just sort of have like a, I generate my SBOM, I compile everything, I do everything all in the same security context, all in the same environment, all at the same time. So when you go, oh geez, what went wrong? I, I don't know, like, is it the, am I using a bad SBOM tool? Am I using a this, that? It becomes very difficult to sort of tease out. That's why we, you know, that, that's I think one of the key bits. Uh, did that answer your question? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it, it it sure did. Look, I'm, I'm I'm much more on this operating big service side of things, and rollback is such a critical part of. Oops, we did something bad. A, a yep. very well intentioned twenty five year old made a bad check in, and now we need to get back as quickly as possible to you know previous known states. So if you answered the question. Great, thank you for yeah. for explaining that. Yeah, and and when it comes to the actual implementation, what a lot of folks do is they do a like um, they'll often have the ability to add additional metadata to um, an image. So like through stuff like tags or whatever, so that you can pretty much say, "Hey, look, I have this. You know, I'm I'm pulling in the latest signed image within our own environment, and you know, I pinned that hash, but I can always go back and say." Great. Uh, this has now been pinned as like has been tagged as essentially as nope, no good. Um, and through our policy engines, we can go in, you know, whether it's a database or whatever, you can go back and say, great, I'm going to go and essentially deploy the last known good one. Um, and there's a bunch of different uh, things that people have been doing on on that end. And it's yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, any other questions? You're good. Cool. Yeah. And just so folks know, like there's uh, this, this document itself does not really talk about implementation specific things. It kind of keeps it a high level architecture. But um, for example, there is uh, an open SSF project that does just sort of, it's more of an example architecture called Fresca, F-R-S-C-A. I'll just type it here. It's, it's not really, uh, um, a few of us who are maintainers on it are, are that, you know, um, uh, I'll just put this here, build sec, all right. And uh, I'll put this here. Not a lot of folks, uh, it, it's, it's not really been um, well maintained. It's mostly just as an example architecture, um, but uh, there's that. And so uh, it uses things like uh, tecton, as tecton, tecton chains, Intoto and all that good stuff. All right, and then the next thing is, uh, where is this? Is supply chain security compromises. So this is an ongoing thing that we've been working on. Um, and this is just stuff that people can submit to. And actually this is probably the first thing that came out of 
a lot of the, the supply chain security work uh, from Tag Security. But there's a bunch of stuff here. Um, I recommend taking a look at it. It's just stuff like, hey, um, you know, MathJS had uh, had a you know a supply chain security attack, and it's just a list of um, various uh, supply chain security compromises. Most of them are cloud native, but we also include a lot of things that are not particularly cloud native as well. And then finally, um, a thing that is currently being worked on uh, is we're building out a sort of an executive summary pa paper uh, around uh, trying to kind of, uh, one of the big things that people have been asking for is, hey, how do I convince my executive, you know, my, the CISO, the, the, the CIO, whomever, that, that uh, supply chain security is a big, big issue. Why should I care about it? And it's a, we're building out a paper on that. It's still in development. Um, and that paper is going into things like, hey, did you know that CISOs are now legally liable for some of these things and that they're potentially going to be fined or even potentially put in prison if they do not, if they're negligent in, in their duties. Um, as well as like uh, cybersecurity uh, insurance is, is being, um, you know, uh, companies are no longer underwriting cybersecurity insurance and that sort of thing as well. Uh, and then um, upcoming work, we're looking at all sorts of different things like potentially SBOMs with refer with you know how SBOM best practices when it comes to some of these things. We're also looking at potentially pulling in other CNCF projects to see if we can actually help out their supply chain security and things like that. And so there's a bunch of different things uh, there. Um, come check us out. We're uh, our meetings are on Friday. Uh, sorry, Thursday. Sorry, our meetings are every Thursday. Um, it's on the, the CNCF calendar, um, and it's also within our, uh, if you go to like the tag security, um, it's down here somewhere under the uh, supply chain security working group. The details are, are there. I'll just actually click that and put that also in the message. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, uh, Cool. Well, thanks. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I, I hope uh, some of you. I hope some of you join. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So Ryan and Microsoft team, uh, you're up with Copa presentation. Yeah. So. Uh... Just a quick intro, um, like Ryan mentioned, COPA was a tool that came out of the Azure Incubations office. Um, and, and, uh, through some experimentation on like, how can we more quickly patch OS level vulnerabilities that show up in container images? Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Sertaj uh, to give a, a quick presentation and demo on how the tool works. Sounds good. Let me sh try to share my screen. Cool. Um, can everybody see my screen? It should be a big introduction to Copacetic. Looks yep. good. Cool. Hmm. Yeah, cool. So what is Copacetic? Uh, so Copacetic is, is by definition is, uh, means in excellent order. And it'd be basically merged in co as in container and then pa as in uh, patching, and then that made Copacetic. And this is our um, uh, GitHub uh, URL, if anybody wants to find it. Uh, but in, in general, Copa, and we call it by short Copa. Um, Copa is a simple tool that helps us fix security issues in container images quickly. Uh, it's a command line tool written in Go, uh, and it's, it's based on uh, BuildKit. Um, and then when vulnerabilities are found in container images, uh, Copa can directly fix those issues without having to rebuild the entire container from scratch. Um, and then the, the reason we needed Copa is that uh, sometimes security problem uh, in container images arise and then they, they need to be fixed urgently uh, and regularly. And then a full rebuild may, may take longer or uh, we may not even uh, have control over the build because it might be an open source project. Um, and in the, the time uh, between finding a vulnerability and it's being actively uh, exploited, uh, m uh, might need to be uh, fast, and then we want to put them as into production as quickly as possible. And here is um, sort of how it works on a higher level. Um, so first, we have a container image that we want to patch. Um, and then here are some of the 
the things that might include so, such as like the OS image, um, and then language as part, frameworks, and application. Um, and um, we, we scan uh, using an open source container scanning tool like Trivi from Aqua Security, uh, but Copa is, is extensible uh, with uh, other providers in the future. Um, I know that uh, we have a contribution uh, that uh, includes a, a, a different scanner today. Um, and then Copa uh, parses the vulnerability report information. Uh, and uh, Copa processes the, the needed update packaging using the applicable package managers tools like APT, APK, YUM, and, and others. Uh, and then finally, uh, Copa applies the uh, resulting update to the container image uh, using BuildKit, creating a, a patch layer. And then let's um, look at the, the benefits uh, of Copa. Um, Copa provides the ability to, to uh, patch containers quickly uh, without going upstream for a full rebuild, uh, which reduces the turnaround time and complexity. If you're relying on third-party images that you don't maintain, uh, their update, update cadences uh, might not meet your SLAs. Um, and Copa allows uh, users other than the image publishers to also patch container images. And image publishers don't need to create new workflows for container patching, uh, since Copa supports patching container images using the security update packages already being published today. Uh, and Copa reduces the uh, storage and transmission costs of redistribu redistributing uh, patched images by only creating an additional patch layer uh, instead of rebuilding the entire image. Uh, and then th this can be uh, ca cached um, and then uh, so this will reduce your st storage and transmission costs. Uh, and then Copa will uh, also provide the ability to patch distroless images, uh, which is not possible today uh, with, uh, without going to the image publisher. And then uh, finally, uh, we just added support for a, a GitHub action. So any, um, any GitHub repo can uh, utilize uh, Copa in their CI uh, pipelines by either in build time uh, and or um, in a recurring fashion using G GitHub actions. And then um, I also want to make sure some of the, the limitations of COPA. Um, so today, Windows uh, containers are not supported by COPA. Uh, and then COPA today only targets the OS level uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and because of this, COPA re requires uh, the use of the, um, the uh, individual package managers like APT, APK, and, and whatnot. And then let's look at a demo. So uh, for this demo, we are just going to look at a uh, real life example. Um, I just pulled this from uh, Docker Hub. This is like an obviously an old Nginx um, uh, image. This is 1.18.0. Uh, so we're just going to look at the vulnerabilities in this package and then specifically on this uh, DP, DPKG package, which is a critical vulnerability. Um, again, this is like an old, old image. So it's, it is going to have a lot of vulnerabilities, as you can see in the Docker Hub. Um, yeah. Hopefully my, okay, cool. Uh, so just for starting, we'll, we'll pull the image. Uh, we don't need to do this, but uh, just so we have it, uh, I'm just gonna demonstrate pulling the image. And then we are going to uh, use Trivi uh, to scan the Nginx 1.18.0 image and then save the output to a JSON file. And then in the next step, um, so now we have the JSON file. We are going to uh, just output the total num uh, number of vulnerabilities uh, to, to see uh, how many um, total number of vulnerabilities, including critical. Uh, so now we have 240 total vulnerabilities um, with 44 being critical. And then let's look at this uh, DPKG uh, package just as an example. So the same thing, we're just going to grab it. Uh, this is one of the critical vulnerabilities. Um, and then this we have 1.19.7 um, in our container. And then 1.19.8 has this uh, patched. So let's verify that we do indeed have 1.19.7. So uh, just run the image with DPKG version, and then we do have 1.19.7. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, run BuildKit as a container locally, uh, but we just added functionality that you can do this directly with Docker. 
uh, or uh, using uh, one of the BuildX uh, build kits. Um, uh, and then, so you don't have to run this container uh, separately. Um, and then starting with Docker 24, it will be supported natively uh, using container D snapshot. Um, and then we are going to use Copa to patch this image. And then we specify the, the patch tag we want, and then the, the specify the, the JSON file of the from the tree v results, and we connect to the build kit. Uh, instance. Uh, and then basically, we, as, as I mentioned, it uses the existing tooling and existing um, repositories that are maintained by the uh, the OS maintainers and package maintainers. Um, so in this case, uh, Copa goes and, and then patches and validates that the, the versions um, are indeed uh, got updated. Uh, so and then we'll go, I think we're going to look at the DPKG package um, and then at the over there somewhere, uh, you'll see like the DPKG got updated to 1.19.8. Um, so let's check if this is indeed present locally. Now we have the original image and then the patched image. So let's run the scan again using Trivi. Um, and then we're just going to grab for total. And now we have zero vulnerabilities. Um, let's verify that we did indeed patch it and then it, it is still running. Um, so I'm just, I just control C out of this. And let's verify that the DPKG uh, package version did indeed get updated. So same DPKG version command and we'll see 1.19.8. Cool, that was the demo and then yeah, so then the call up to action, please try out COPPA uh, if you're interested and then report the bugs that you find. Um, and if you have any contributions, uh, you're very welcome uh, to submit any issues and or PRs. Uh, and then our future work is we just uh, released um, GitHub Action support uh, and um, uh, Docker BuildX support and then Docker native support. Um, we are... Um, uh, more future work is more scanner supports, and we are in the process of uh, as one more uh, to turn it to CNCF as a sandbox project. Thank you, Sotak. Um, so I do have a question. Um, I wanted to understand more about testing, right? Um, sometimes when you make OS updates, your application components can break, right? So you are assuming that that will be done in the yeah we, we would uh, so Copa in itself doesn't do any testing I'm gonna make sure I'm not gonna, yeah uh, Copa itself doesn't do any testing because Copa doesn't really know any of the, the what what the, the 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 images do say like nginx uh, Copa ver verifies the uh, the packages that it, it got patched but it doesn't know anything about nginx so it would be up to the to the to the teams that are using and consuming these images to do their testing. So if they're um, utilizing nginx, they would need to make sure that they they have their e two es and however they want to test it uh, to make sure that it performs as expected. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon has a question. Brandon. Yeah, this reminds me of all the promises of build packs, but implemented completely differently. So it's it's an interesting take on it. I'm curious when you start to build out these layers, you, you add a new patch layer on top of the image whenever you make a change. What happens when the next week goes by or next week? Are you just going to go back and start from the yes, original image that, that, and make that's one a patch great question. Layer, or are you going to keep adding layers on top of this? Yes, that, that's a great, great question. It will uh, add layers on top of it, uh, but um, we are considering um, on if, if we, we don't need to do that. But in, so internally, we use this tool also. But the way we use it is we patch the uh, vanilla image. So there is only one layer that gets added because it doesn't matter if you do multiple patches over time, as long as you get to a final state where there are no OS vulnerabilities, that's what you want. Uh, because, and then you can basically use the unmodified vanilla image uh, and then patch directly to the final. Uh, so you don't have to do N minus one. Any other questions for Sotak? 
I'll throw one more out there, which is I'm curious where you're seeing the demand these days for this kind of tool. Because usually when I think about these things, I'm used to seeing places just say, just rebuild it from the beginning, start back over and go back through our entire pipeline. That way it hits the test and all the other stages of the CI pipeline. Who out there is saying we need this today? Uh, so for example, for, for this one, we have internal teams that are using images and they have certain uh, compliance requirements like FedRAMP and then they they must patch the uh, images in, in certain timeframes. Um, and because they require, say, like an open source image like Nginx that they don't build, um, and they have these stringent re requirements, so they have to patch these images. So that, that will be definitely be one of the cases. And then another case that um, I can see is, uh, so say, let's take um, uh, Kubernetes, for example. Uh, let's take the Kube proxy image that is based on um, uh, it, it, uh, based on distroless, and then Kubernetes creates a a distroless base image, and then there is a distroless IP tables image, and then that's what Kube proxy uses. So there are like so many layers that are in, in between. So to be able to get something patched in Kube proxy uh, would require distroless IP tables to be patched, which requires distroless base to be patched, and then distroless to be patched. But like, why not just patch this directly instead of having all these um, sort of wheels turn and have the, this is a dependency on me, this is a dependency on me, so we can go directly patch the Kube proxy image. So in terms of assessments, you've gone through the security assessment, self-assessment, security pulse, et cetera, or you are in the process of doing all that? So tech? Um, we have not gone through it. I think we'll, we'll need, need to go through those things. Got you. Thank you. Um, so um, Justin, this is in your queue then coming in your queue soon, I guess. Any other questions for Sertek? Any other comments that yeah. you would like to make? We have, uh, the team? <laughs> we have a couple of questions in the chat. I added one because I saw something in the demo that made me a little confused and maybe I'm just not used to looking at that output, but I was excited to see original image and then image dash patch, patched, but I saw in the demo what looked to be the same two year, two year. And I thought, wait, if it just got patched, wouldn't that date have changed? Or unless that doesn't refer to that and it refers to something else. Um. I am not sure. I think that's the created date. Um, oh, that's created date, not updated yeah. date. Right. Okay. Yeah, I don't. When yes. when Docker images to the, the CLI <laughs> command, it, it doesn't show the modified date. Right. There's another question from Rita, I think, in the chat as well. Um, so, any thoughts of working with K8? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that was actually I created an issue in the, the Kubernetes uh, C the, the uh, Kubernetes release. To be able to automate the, the the patching of these images, that this is this is definitely something that I would like to do. Um, That's good. Uh, Any yeah. other questions, folks, for Sotek? Not. Thank you very much, Sotek, for the demo and the presentation. Thank you, Microsoft team. Appreciate it Thank very you. much. And we'd we'll like to get uh, the slides, if possible, uh, for tech, the initial slides that you presented. Yeah, absolutely. That, Where can I send them? Um, you can email those to me. Okay, cool. Uh, or, um, or send on Slack. Um, we have a Slack channel as cool. well. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I can reach out to you and send them. Sounds great. Thank you very much. So, folks, we have 10 minutes. Uh, anybody wants to bring up any other issues or concerns or topics for future discussion? If not, then you can take 10 minutes break before your next meeting. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for your participation today. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.